Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. We are talking about how do you transform healthcare through all the many different levers that we could activate in suicide prevention. We have federal government, technology, healthcare, and accreditation represented today. Um, anybody who attended the session this morning, this is uh, kind of a nice bookend. This morning really talked about clinical care and interventions and the role of technology. And right now I think we'll be talking a little bit more about the public health approach to suicide prevention, but also the many different um, communities and sectors that we have to employ if we really want to nudge uh, suicide in this country. I'm Julie Goldstein Grummet. I'm the director of the Zero Suicide Institute and vice president for suicide prevention strategy at the Education Development Center. And I'm really pleased to have everybody join us today. I think people know suicide is really a challenge in the country for every age group and every demographic, and it, it doesn't, uh, you know, it, it, it really doesn't matter where you come from or how old you are or your race or your religion. Everybody is struggling with uh, suicide. We know that about 12 to 15 million people have thoughts of suicide every year. And so a lot of the time when we think about suicide prevention, it's not just reducing deaths, although of course we certainly want to reduce deaths in this country. It's the 11th leading cause of death in this country, and as uh, that's horrible because we do think it's preventable if we ask the right questions and intervene. But the idea that people around you, 12 to 15 million people, are having thoughts of suicide is also really, we want to give people a higher quality of life. And I think there's a lot of different levers we can use um, earlier to really activate that. So first, I just want to have my panel uh, introduce themselves and say where you're from and, and what's your role in suicide prevention. So I'm Michael Johnson. I'm the Senior Managing Director of Behavioral Health with CARF International. We're an accrediting organization. We accredit um, across a variety of different um, life areas, um, behavioral health being one that, that I'm the leader of. And so um, it sort of falls to me to be the person who is trying to figure out how we can adjust our standards in order to be able to um, adopt and implement um, sort of good or best practices in suicide prevention care. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. Hi, um, thanks so much for having me on this panel. I'm Mark Friedlander, a psychiatrist by background. Uh, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Universal Health Services. Uh, we have about 180 freestanding psychiatric inpatient uh, facilities and addictions treatment centers in 40 states around the country. Uh, my name is Zach Immel. I'm a licensed psychologist by background, and I'm the chief science officer and co-founder of Listen.io, which is a technology company that evaluates the quality of behavioral health conversations and can rate them for things like uh, the quality of motivational interviewing and CBT. But in this particular case, we are now working with crisis centers to evaluate uh, suicide risk assessment and other aspects of quality crisis counseling. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deb Stone. I am a uh, senior advisor for suicide prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I've been working in suicide prevention for over 20 years, and our focus at CDC really is on uh, a public health approach to suicide prevention and using a comprehensive approach. So that's uh, the angle that some of my comments will be um, taking today. Thanks for having me. So to begin, I, and I'll start with you, Deb, um, can you share a challenge, and I'll ask everybody to, to respond to this, but share a challenge that you see in healthcare as it relates to suicide prevention and one solution or innovation that you're doing from where you sit to address that challenge. Sure, so um, as I mentioned, CDC's role is really in taking that public health approach and that really starts with data. So um, the challenge that I'm going to um, put forward is related to data. And um, in suicide prevention generally and within healthcare systems um, more specifically, um, we really have a lack of um, timely data. And that can be challenging as we're trying to prevent suicide using older data. So um, one of the uh, 
innovations or solutions that CDC has focused on is um, leveraging what's called um, syndromic surveillance data. And syndromic surveillance is actually um, data that's available um, to public health officials. And it is uh, data from emergency department visits for a range of health conditions, including suicide ideation and suicide attempts. And syndromic surveillance allows um, public health officials to receive data on emergency department visits for these um, conditions uh, within 24 hours, typically within 24 hours of an emergency department visit. So this really um, allows our states and communities out in the field to um, know who, you know, to monitor and track these emergency department visits and to better inform uh, their suicide prevention as a result. Sure. Um, can you all hear me? Uh, uh, it's really hard to improve what doesn't get measured. And at, at the moment, for the most part, there are certainly green shoots of people who are trying um, this. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. I, I, will, I won't talk so loud this way. Um, so it's really hard to, measure, to improve what doesn't get measured. And, and right now, it is extremely hard to measure what happens in the most important parts of care, which is the actual care itself. The conversations that we're having either in an in-person clinic, in a behavioral health clinic where you're working with someone who's having thoughts of suicide, or in some of the work we're doing with crisis call centers. And so um, I think one of the biggest challenges if we're gonna make some large-scale improvements in the quality of the services we're providing to people is that we have to start figuring out a strategy to measure the care we're providing at scale and not just small reports and small numbers of, of that, but large amounts of that. And we, we at Listen are working on this technology where we can do that in a way that wasn't possible a few years ago. I would answer the question by, by kind of pointing out that if we're talking about facility-based care, primarily inpatient care, we just have a person for a tiny period of time during the course of the trajectory of their suicidal episode, thinking uh, the, the course they're gonna follow. It makes it very challenging to kind of figure out what they need next, and I think our biggest challenge is that transition from our facility into, back into the community, the community that might be promoting their suicidal thinking. Uh, so I'd, I'd kind of say, I'll, you know, kind of filling those gaps and seams that, that occur in transitioning folks through the various levels of care is, is our biggest challenge. So it's interesting and I love the fact that we have this panel that has all of these different um, places in the system. <clears throat> and a lot of times I think that the, there's a challenge around people thinking like, who is it that sets the agenda for activity that happens. Sometimes people think that it's a payer, sometimes people think it's a regulator, sometimes people think it's an accrediting body. And I know for us as an accreditor, um, it's not very easy for an accrediting body to actually just sort of dictate rules. So the way that standards of care are developed is actually through a fairly significant consensus-based process. So when you want to make change, you have to get a lot of people on the same train moving towards that change in order for it to be accepted. And we can't get out too far ahead. We can tweak things here and there where we're trying to make an impact on um, particular practices, but accreditation on a whole, it's a systems-wide approach. And we have to think about standards for CARF anyway globally. So the way that we write standards is just as, it has to be just as applicable to a program anywhere in the world in which we would accredit. So um, it tends to not be at the, the, the bleeding edges um, of the system. It tends to be a little bit more conservative than that. So that's a, a big challenge in, in turning a ship um, very quickly. And I think you're all getting at, I mean, certainly the role of data I think is really critical. You don't know, if you're not measuring what you're doing, how do you actually know that you're doing it? And, but one of the things I think we see in healthcare, and you know, I'm sure people in this audience have experienced this, is if you have a medical crisis, if you're diagnosed with, with 
uh, prostate cancer or you're having symptoms of a heart attack, whether you're in Florida or New York or Michigan, you're going to get more or less similar care. Your physicians are going to describe what's going to happen next. There's going to be certain standards that are expected to be met. And yet in behavioral health and very particularly in suicide prevention and care, that just doesn't exist. And so we really put the burden on the family who thinks, right, a lot of our upstream activities are identify people, whether it's the faith community or schools or, or primary care or other levers that do the identification, but then get them to health care and they're going to take care of you. And I, it's really a fallacy because most health care providers are not trained in suicide specific interventions, not in graduate school and they're not required through CEs. So, you know, I'll start with you, Mark. Is there a, is, why is this and is there a gold standard that people should be adhering to when it comes to suicide care? You know, I'm, I'm going to answer this question from my bias as a physician. So a physician likes a protocol that says, if someone has strep throat, give them penicillin for seven days and they will improve. They will be cured. We don't have that in suicide prevention. We don't have a single cause of suicidal thinking. It's so multifactorial uh, and there's so many risk factors. So if I think about um, the, the typical patient I would be uh, seeing if, if someone is referred to me because uh, they have suicidal thinking, it's going to be someone with significant depression. And that's something that I can relate to. I can pull out a prescription pad and that's the way I as a physician like to think. But what if it's primarily because of the, the circumstances in which the person lives? The person has feelings of despair. You know, we often talk about addiction and suicidal thinking as symptoms of despair. So my prescription pad is not going to make the slightest bit of difference. We have to think multifactorially. We have to think about um, connecting these folks, giving them a sense of purpose. I can't pull out a prescription pad and write, give this person a sense of purpose so that they're less likely to attempt or complete suicide. So it is very difficult, it is very challenging to develop protocols uh, or guidelines that are going to be helpful. So we have to look at some of the low-hanging fruit rather than a complete picture. And I think for many of us in the behavioral health field, we want a complete picture. So to me, the low-hanging fruit are the, the transitions in care, identifying some of the factors that may um, increase the risk. Uh, because by the time we've, we've interacted with the individual, perhaps we've achieved lower risk rather than no risk for them. So I think the guidelines have to be realistic. They have to kind of point at some of the things that can be done, the, the blocking and tackling that needs to be done to transition folks to different levels of care. Uh, and those guidelines are uh, somewhat rudimentary. They're also angled at different, you know, kind of directed at, at different components of the system. So they're great guidelines that come from a number of agencies pointing at how best to do the transitions. But from the psychiatrist's perspective, we're taking a look at what can I put on my prescription pad. And what role do you think liability and fear of liability plays in that? Well, I think it drives so much of what uh, happens in our facilities. But, you know, it, it's not just about liability. I think one of the benefits of uh, kind of a litigious environment is it forces an organization like mine, for example, where we have something like 700, close to 800,000 unique individuals going through our facilities per year. A significant number of suicide attempts within our facilities. Uh, it forces us to take a look at the data. So we're taking a look at when during the course of a hospitalization is a person more likely to attempt suicide? What um, behaviors will they demonstrate before attempting suicide? Where in the facility are they likely, more likely to attempt suicide? But kind of taking a look at the, what, what the fear of liability forces us to do is take a look at those kinds of factors so that we can perhaps um, have a more robust response when we see certain triggers. Uh, to me, the concern is, I don't think those data are shared widely because those data are available to our malpractice carrier, to our liability carrier. They're interested in that, but I'm not sure that they shared more widely. Yeah, I would agree. I think if we can't benchmark how well we're doing 
against how other healthcare systems are doing, how are we expected to learn and grow? And I don't think that they're shared widely. Um, Michael, as, a, as an accreditor, you've been involved in creating standards for suicide prevention. And so can you tell us a little bit about what's included in CARF's accreditation standard and maybe how's that going with people meeting those standards? And we'll keep it in this room because we're among friends. Yeah, so um, that it, it's true that, and I, I'm having two competing thoughts at the same time, sorry, um, that those two thoughts collided. Um, I'm gonna say that, you know, it, particularly in behavioral healthcare, so in healthcare you always have sort of this science to practice gap that exists and it tends to be longer in behavioral health than it is in other parts of healthcare or in medicine, right? And so people hypothesize that it takes about 17 years from the time that something is published to when it is widely adopted um, in behavioral health care. So I think that you know you are doing a lot of research and education and, and trying to get organizations to adopt um, better suicide care. Um, I think that's having an impact. It's slow, um, but there are things that are happening. Um, a few years ago, we put in our standards just some a couple of basic things, which is that um, in any behavioral health program that you must use a standardized tool to screen for suicide for every single person that presents for care. Um, so that took it away from the part of did a individual clinician ask somebody about their perhaps history of suicide and if they had thoughts of suicide and trying to make that interpretation to get to a more objective approach to that and then based on the risk factors that an, org that an individual presented with the organization needed to have a protocol of how are they going to respond to those risks through safety planning and stuff like that. And then we also built in, and I have less confidence in this particular issue, what Dr. Friedlander was talking about, which is we have an expectation that the organization is seeking to improve the way that they manage those care transitions. The reason why I say I have less confidence in that is um, that's one of the challenges that many organizations, you know, that is a significantly important thing, right? Um, a person who is leaving a hospital or a crisis unit is at three, I saw that data recently, 300% more likely to take their life on that day um, than any other, than, than the general population. So it's crucial that we don't look at them as, here's a referral, good luck. Um, which is what still happens the vast majority of the time. Um, and so, you know, the question that Julie is asking is, is how, so how are people doing as we've been making these standards changes? Um, I can tell you the, the party line of this would be that um, we have probably better than 95% conformance in our accredited organizations that they have implemented activities around this. So that's what the data would tell us. Now if I'm going to be really scrutinizing this, looking at inter-rater reliability from surveyors, I would have some questions about that, right? Because, um, because unfortunately, like our surveyors are also products of the environment and the field. And so if, if they walk into an organization and says, well, they're doing it just as well or not as well as we do, it's good enough. And so it becomes challenging to implement like forceful change when the field does not accept um, that this is what it should look like and we don't have universally accepted standards that say this is exactly what that care should look like to Dr. Freelander's point that you can say this is exactly the protocol that everyone should use. Um, so that's some of the challenge I think in it there. And I think even, you know, if you look over chart audits as part of those surveys, there's, it may look like somebody did a screener and the example that I always use is, you know, if Zach is my patient and I say, hey, I'm really sorry I have to ask you all these questions, but we're asking everybody. So, like, you're not having trouble sleeping, right? Click no. You're not, things are, you're, things are going well for you. You like to do the activities you always do. Yeah. You're not having thoughts of suicide, right? It'll look like I did the screening tool because it'll go click, 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 no, no, no. And from you know, an audit perspective, it'll look really good. But from a quality and a true patient-centered, and am I actually opening the door for him to t disclose his thoughts of suicide? Absolutely not, right? And so that's where we really talk a lot in the zero suicide framework about its leadership and the culture and why the training that matters for clinicians to understand why we're using these tools. 
Um, so, but Zach, I guess I, I want to think about how do healthcare systems kind of given all this, how do they know and how do they report on using these evidence-based interventions that, you know, how do they know they're really working towards reducing suicidal thoughts and behaviors? As, as a scientist, I'm, I'm really excited we're talking about inter-rater reliability here today. So I can, well, I, I, won't, I won't go further into that. But, the, uh, you know, what I would say, um, I first volunteered at a crisis line when I was 19. And they gave, I had a couple hours of training. They gave me two cell phones, one that rang and one that I used to call my supervisor. And the supervisor was two years older than me. Um, and the way I could get quality feedback was by self-report. So a 20-year-old with no clinical background was essentially responsible for describing to my supervisor how I'm struggling and what I'm doing and what I'm not doing. And so I, I think that is probably an extreme version of what is actually the standard of care in most places these days, which is that we, we rely on people to tell us what they're doing whether or not they actually have the ability to tell us, and whether or not their standard for what they're doing may vary quite a bit from person to person. And so I, I think what our health system's doing, I think at least if you just focus in one particular area where I I'm, feel the most comfortable and related to suicide is that there are emerging existing standards for crisis care. There are um, incentives and requirements for monitoring it, um, the quality of what happens, during uh, calls, but those are done with, with humans, right? And so it involves either a human listening to a call or coming back and listening to it later after it happened. And if any of you have ever done this, it's extremely difficult work, right? It's not just how emotional and difficult the conversation can be to listen to and to listen to them repeatedly all day when you're not able to impact those conversations. But then we have thoughts of inner rater reliability, drift over time, turnover among your raters, and then even if you do a really, really good job at that, you maybe you're capturing 1% of the entire amount of care that's being provided. And so it's similar to you know, turning on a basketball game, watching one minute of it and saying, I kind of get a sense of what's going on here, and turning it off, right? And so most of care is just unobserved. And so there are certainly things where we can get much more broad in, um, information related to, you know, assessing satisfaction, assessing how people are feeling after the end of the call. Those are all things that we should be doing and should, we should scale more appropriately. But I think true changes in quality of behavioral health care, particularly in suicide care, will require us to start to measure at the point of care what's happening. And so, Mark, I'm going to turn to you because you're leading one of the largest healthcare systems in the country, and before that came from the payer world. Michael was describing there are evidence based practices, the science exists, we know screening works, we know safety plans work, we know care transitions, we know things like DBT and cognitive therapy for suicide prevention. I mean, there is evidence for concrete evidence for practices and interventions that show evidence that they reduce suicidal thoughts and behaviors. But how do we better marry that up in a way that we, that payers um, are aware and will finance those, those interventions? Well, I, you know, I think that's a, um, the, the crux of this whole matter. Um, I think the whole delivery system is driven by the reimbursement system. So the way the reimbursement system is set up currently does not incentivize um, the kind of behavior that we would all as ethical providers want to see. So if you take a hypothetical health plan with say 20 million subscribers, 2,000 of their members are gonna die each year from suicide. They're gonna spend close to a billion dollars a year on providing care for suicide attempts um, you know, the intentional self-inflicted injury, intentional overdoses, and much of that billion dollars is going to be on the medical side, not the behavioral health side. Emergency department visits, um, but it's going to be on the medical side. So the scale is huge. But as a provider, um, my organization is incentivized to do brief, cross-sectional care instead of taking a detailed look at the multi-factors that are involved and providing longitudinal, ongoing support. So until we can get the reimbursement system to incentivize adequate transitions, 
adequate aftercare. There's gonna be this disconnect between what the providers in the acute setting are doing and what the actual individual needs. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that there is greater awareness of that's what's needed. Uh, but there's also the, the whole issue of you know, where, where is the boundary between what the reimbursement system under a health plan gets involved in versus what's a societal problem, what's an educational problem. These are all blurred boundaries uh, and it becomes very tricky uh, for the payer to figure out where to draw that line. So I'm going to give everybody their magic wand as they answer this next question because I think this conference is all about the intersection of, of technology, payers, innovation. You know, we've made incredible progress even in the last few years. I've, I've been doing suicide prevention for like 25 years. Um, and the progress is, is so exponential now than it was in the you know, first 20 years, I think, of, of my career. But we know that patients, their families deserve quality, timely, effective, the treatments, interventions that we were just talking about, where, when, and how they need it. And we've heard amazing examples throughout this conference that are bringing care directly to consumers, which is phenomenal. Um, but, but there is still an ethos, I think, of tolerating less than that in suicide prevention. And so I look to each of you and say, um, how, you know, how can we ensure that care is high quality, meaningful, intentional, and evidence-based. You, you can even use your magic wand or tell us a little bit about you know, what you would love to see happen in the next couple of years, because I think these are the people in the room who have access to, to making that happen. Whoever wants to take <laughs> um, Well, I can start. I, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of ways to um, assure um, improved care, and one of the ways is to um, really support um, people in communities and um, hopefully reduce the flow of people into the healthcare system, perhaps in the first place. And um, that can be through um, evidence-based interventions in communities that really address um, social determinants of health. Um, and I like how uh, Mark has mentioned uh, multiple times the, um, the fact that suicide is not caused by any single thing and it is multifactorial. And so I think there's a lot of things that we can do um, upstream to address people's situations at home and in schools, in the workplace, by integrating suicide prevention into those settings and sectors, and also um, supporting youth to um, have improved abilities to cope and problem solve and to feel safe in their communities. And also um, just thinking about the intersection of communities and healthcare systems and what that looks like. And so um, we know that you know, having partnerships, public-private sector partnerships, and being able to interact um, between community and healthcare systems is really important. So if there were, um, you know, uh, opportunities for folks in healthcare to join in some of these um, community-based organizations and coalitions to really think through what are the ways that we can um, best support um, people at risk and, and avoid folks from becoming um, suicidal in the first place. And of course, there's a range of things that we can do um, once people do get in into care, and um, you know, these are some important issues that we're talking about: reimbursement and transitions, and making sure the healthcare system and people are educated and have our you know their standards are in place. So you know, I I look at it from a broad perspective, and obviously that's not just one thing, Julie. That's like a whole bunch of things, um, but those are some of the things that I would like to see. That I guess I would sum it up as like. Um, supporting people before they become suicidal, and then that integration of um, community and systems-based suicide prevention. Um, I, I guess I would, uh, two, two related areas. One, I guess, um, for employers. I think it would be really interesting 
if employers said to the providers they work with, that's really exciting that you have access to 20,000 providers, but I'm not very interested in working with you unless you can tell me population level information on what interventions they're providing. What is the quality of what they're doing and how do I know? And that could change a lot of things pretty quickly because um, we, we have the technology to answer those sorts of questions now. Um, on the government side, I actually think there are models for this already, and some of them are, in, to me at least, um, in unexpected areas. There, there is legislation in child welfare that requires evidence of fidelity to evidence-based practices to receive federal funding. And states and municipalities and counties have to submit plans in order to get the funding that they've asked for from the federal government to demonstrate that they're doing the types of evidence-based interventions that are gonna promote permanency for kids and keeping them with their homes. And so I think there are different sorts of strategies where we have to push, uh, to use your metaphor, levers to change behavior. Um, and that maybe if we would have tried to do this 10 years ago, it would have been impossible to respond to some of these requests at a level that we would have wanted to. And now I think things are shifting to where it can be possible. I think what has me most optimistic is basic human nature. So I work with um, several thousand uh, psychiatrists, and I think that natural competitiveness that our providers have is just wonderful because uh, when they see their data, the first thing they all look for is, am I below average? And if someone is below average, they will do something about it. Nobody wants to be labeled as being below average. So the challenge is find the right rating scales, find the right metrics to measure their effectiveness. Right now in our system, we're using very broad-based, very uh, rudimentary symptom checklists, but eventually we can get to a point where we're specifically looking at conditions, whether it's suicide, whether it's an eating disorder, whether it's PTSD, you know, depending on what the facility specializes in, we can tailor it to specific conditions. And then allowing the, the practitioners, whether they're psychiatrists, psychologists, nurse practitioners, to see their data and how they stack up compared to their peers, allows them to kind of identify who's a superstar, who is struggling, and have the two of them sit together and kind of compare practice styles. Because when I speak to a psychiatrist who is a superstar and say, you know, you're great, what are you doing? I want to learn from you. First of all, they don't know that they're average or above average. They don't know that they're a superstar. And their gen generic answer is, I'm doing what I've always done. Similarly, with the folks that are underperforming, their response is, I'm working so hard. I was so well trained. I'm so dedicated. I'm so devoted. How could what I be doing be anything but top quality? So I think creating that awareness through the use and sharing of data is what fills me with optimism that we can make a difference in how care is delivered to the individual experiencing uh, suicidal thinking. I'll say I have two, two things. One is, you know, as an, from, from our role as an accreditor, um, I think if, if sort of universally we coalesced around what the appropriate protocol for suicide care was that we all just sort of universally agree on, then we can try to help to ensure that everyone is maintaining fidelity to what that is. But I think that we're always reluctant in our space, in behavioral health particularly, I always say that we let perfect get in the way of, of good all the time. Um, so we, we continue to resist adopting any particular strategy to treat anything um, because we're afraid that it's not the best that it could possibly be. And if we're all consistently doing something better, um, I think that incrementally moves us and we'll learn from that, you know, um, because we'll have consistency of practice. Um, I think that if I was, if you gave me a magic wand to say, what would you do to wave around this um, for suicide in general? I think that it, it's really speaking to something that Mark was sharing, which is that, you know, the payers, um, they're not necessarily incentivized in providers the right way. Um, and I think that the only reason that that's true is, is that we continue to operate a disintegrated specialty behavioral health system. Um, that is not working at whole person care. <clears throat> that creates significant challenges to be able to 
adequately fund the right kind of behavioral health care because all of the savings accrue to the health side. If, the, if you do better behavioral health care, it costs more, but it saves money on, on the physical health side. But because those two things are disconnected, you know, it's hard to, to um, provide the right, right dosage of behavioral health care. But then lastly, even if we did all of that, you know, from a behavioral health perspective, only 30% of people who die by suicide are connected to behavioral health at that time, which means 70% aren't. Um, and so even if we, I mean, I'm not trying to minimize the 30%, you know, if we shrink that to zero, we still have work to do um, in, you know, how do we activate the right social levers, I think, that Deb was talking about um, in the community, so. And I think if I just, uh, you know, there's one area that people didn't mention, so I'll use my magic wand, which is I think in medical care, and I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, we're very careful to tell people newly diagnosed what to expect, who to go to, how often that dosage will, will be necessary, how often they'll have to attend, you know, how long, what the duration is, what the prognosis is. And it, we are very fearful, in my experience, to do that in behavioral health. And so parents and loved ones think that um, they're taking somebody to an expert, and it, it's very, um, it's, it's, there's, it's incredibly vague with a complete lack of transparency. Parents think, thank God I got my, my loved one in, my child in, but they don't really know what to expect and they don't know the right questions to ask. So I think my magic wand would be that there'd be a lot of education and an expectation that there's education for this is what you should expect, this is what I can, you know, I promise you I can offer you hope. If you stay with me, this is why I need you to come back to the next appointment. This is how people do. This is how I offer a, a life worth living and resiliency, but you have to show up. And if you don't show up, this is what will happen because we take this seriously and not really kind of put it on the burden of the, the family of, hey, you know, Zach, you missed your appointment. Call me to reschedule. That's, and I, again, I think that's what we do now. So I think healthcare systems, I, I'd love to see payers and others really adopt strategies where education is paramount. But... Um, and shifting gears, I, you know, I don't know if people know there's a national strategy for suicide prevention. We are in the process of updating that. Deb is leading that. And so maybe without giving too much away, um, what can you tell us? What's a snapshot of what we can expect? Sure. Um, and I am working with uh, a lot of folks on this um, and co-leading with my colleagues at the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration and also um, with uh, NIMH and, um, and uh, ASPE and um, some others. All and the acronyms. Yeah, all the acronyms. Um, but in any case, uh, yes, yeah, so in March of this past year, um, we were approached by the um, White House uh, to develop a new national strategy for suicide prevention. And as Julie mentioned, the current one is um, from 2012 and has um, been in place for quite a while. And so we were overdue. And so this new strategy um, that we're developing uh, with a interagency work group of 19 federal agencies and offices, if you can imagine, um, all interested in suicide prevention, has come together, put together a whole series of goals and objectives. Um, those goals and objectives address four strategic directions. The first strategic direction is related to community and comprehensive suicide prevention, um, looking at those factors upstream that we can address, um, including economics, including um, housing, including um, uh, access to health care, including um, education, and um, reducing access to lethal means among people at risk. So we're talking about what are these things upstream. And then the second strate strategic direction really revolves around um, improving um, treatment and crisis services and addressing many of the um, barriers and issues that have been brought up 
in this panel today. So um, I'm really excited about that. And um, there's going to be a real focus on how do we improve ass um, assess screening and assessment and treatment and get those evidence-based prevention um, treatments out there into the community so that people can access them and um, we can really uh, start to improve some of the um, care and the gaps that, that we're seeing. Um, and then the third uh, strategic direction relates to um, some of the um, data challenges that um, have I've alluded to regarding timely and useful data that's accessible, that's quality, that's not you know lagged so much. And um, it also addresses improved surveillance and the ability to um, track and monitor in near real time what's going on in our communities and health systems. And also improvements in research and quality improvement. So we're, we're really looking at the whole range of what we can do um, from communities to health systems. And as well, um, within our fourth strategic direction, we're looking at um, health equity and suicide prevention. So how can we make sure all of the things that we've been talking about are available and accessible to um, populations that have been disproportionately affected by suicide, um, and we can have a workforce that represents those populations, and we can have standards, and all of the things that we want to see, and there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a, quite a wealth of um, objectives that we're striving for, but frankly, that's what's needed, and this strategy really will not only build on um, the 2012 strategy, but will fill the gaps and really um, uh, reflect the advancements that have been, um, that we have seen in recent years. And um, hopefully through this approach and an action, a federal action plan. So all of these agencies that I mentioned, 19 agencies are committing to taking actions to address these goals and objectives and we will have evaluation and monitoring um, is, our, is our goal for that. So hopefully we can save lives through this um, national strategy. So in the time we have left, I want to give each member of the panel a chance to share any final thoughts that perhaps they haven't shared and maybe an action step that they want um, today's audience to take away and, and work on in their sector. So <clears throat> this is me personally. I'm not representing CARF as an organization in this statement, um, so I want to be clear about that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think that we have to get, like, we collectively in our space, in the behavioral health space, I think that we have to get better at um, getting comfortable with having conversations with patients about um, their thoughts of suicide. Um, I think that it's something that we have built a system in which if a person often expresses a symptom of you know, what's going on in their life, um, they become hospitalized, we hospitalize them. Like it's almost a do not pass go, we just immediately go in that direction. So what we tell people in that behavior is, is I can't talk to you about this one symptom. I can talk to you about all of these other things, but I can't talk to you about this one symptom because if I do that, you're not gonna listen to me. You're going to then take me to the hospital, which is not what I need in this moment. Um, and so ultimately I think that starts in training. I think that starts in clinical practice training. I think that starts in supervision and helping um, people to know how to evaluate what that risk is and how to respond meaningfully to the person in that moment um, with some discomfort that we may have with that um, in order to not traumatize people um, and make it so that they are unwilling to share that. So like that's the one thing that I think that we have to figure out how to get better at and we need to figure out what are the levers that we need to implement um, so that that is not um, the risk that we're putting our folks at um, when they come to us and they're supposed to be trusting us to help them um, and not harm them. Yeah, I know we're out of time. Um, I'm just gonna say measurement-based care, um, protocol-driven care, evidence-based care. Do you have any 
any action steps you want people to take home and get started on? Yeah, follow the protocols. <laughs> I think it would be really cool if we could expand the idea of what we could actually measure. And so um, if you went to a presentation on how 988 is going, instead of just hearing, which is very exciting, the number of calls answered, how fast they were answered, whether or not they were answered in state. What about the amount of empathy expressed to the, pay, the people who called? The number of risk assessments that happened for people who expressed thoughts? Those are things we could actually measure. I think um, what I would offer is that I'd like to see um, further uh, stigma reduction um, both um, in communities and within healthcare systems because I think some of these issues that we're talking about are there's still a lot of stigma and uncertainty about mental health and um, how to address it and how to bring it up and so I that would be my thing is to how to help people feel more comfortable and how in expressing the need for help and receiving that um, really compassionate care. And we know from recent studies that the general population actually stigma is going down. It may not always feel like that, but most people feel like suicide's preventable and they would step in and help somebody if they knew they were at risk and that the majority of people have sought mental health services for themselves. So I think we're in that time and able to do that. Um, I wanna thank our panel for joining us today and all of you for joining us and thanks for having us.